All right, welcome everybody. This is the Youngstown Computer Show. I am Joe Danier, owner of Youngstown Computer, and this is your show where we talk about things that are happening in tech. Uh, also advocating for the businesses and uh, and commerce and people of the city of Youngstown. So we are ch always championing the cause, uh, getting everybody, keeping everybody involved, and doing what we can to promote and and you know provide the information of what's going on uh, around town. Uh, earlier today, I was I, I had the toy show over at the uh, the Metroplex, and I try I, I do my best that when I see something come across the news, I uh, at least try to make an appearance and show my support and uh, let me be counted at the gate. Uh, and it, it was kind of interesting. Uh, but the two shows that I sort of had on my list was uh, the toy show and then that Comic Con uh, version that that goes down at Cavelli. Still haven't been to that one, but uh, it's really cool that our area attracts these kinds of events and uh, it was packed so i i really appreciate uh the fact that you know when when we are called to action to go out there and support the events of our city that we always do so and i really appreciate everybody who does that and please continue to do that uh you know just this weekend we we, we sort of had this uh you know we, we would go out on weekends and we'd find ourselves regularly in pittsburgh and cleveland and 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 that those entertainment dollars you know could be spent here if we would just you know, experiment a little bit and try to figure out how to get the same stuff done downtown. And and I'm telling you, like you could spend a good deal of uh, a, good, a good deal of time exploring the different venues and events and restaurants and whatever that's downtown. Uh, I think we shied away for too many years from you know go visiting and and spending that way. And it is really exciting. So if you haven't done so in a while, maybe one weekend, give it a shot. And and it, you know, maybe when the weather gets a little bit better, uh, nicer, warmer, that you can head down there and see if. Uh, See if anybody's down there. Any restaurants that makes make interest? We've got the Labor Museum. We've got the Butler. Uh, we've got events going all all the time down at uh, Cavelli. Uh, in one week, I found myself at Stambaugh for two separate events. So uh, lots of lots of good stuff that that's happening around town. So again, I appreciate it. Uh, last week, I did a little bit of experiment, and uh, I, I bought a Tesla a couple weeks ago. And and I'm putting it through its trials. You know, one of the big questions everybody hits me with is, you know, what what if, what if you run out? What if you run out of electricity? And it's a real concern. And uh, and so last week I decided to head up to Lake Erie, and uh, it was a 82 mile trip. I went to up to Geneva on the lake and uh, Walnut Beach and and whatnot. And uh, there is no charging stations from here. So you have to make sure that you're able to get there and back. So 160 miles. My car, when I charge it uh, at max, will get like 270 miles. Now, when it's cold outside, you know, like with your cell phones, the batteries start limiting when you have the, the uh, you know, cold temperatures. Tesla re released all these updates that attempt to keep the battery warm so that you don't lose charge. And, and, and where your range would originally be 270 miles, that might shrink down to 200 so, or even more than that, some people were reporting every, anywhere to a forty percent decrease in the in the mileage once the temperature got below, you know, thirty thirty degrees. And so that was my big experiment. I didn't know what was going to happen. I mean, I, I drive the thing every day, and you know, I I I don't really pay attention. I know that when I start the day, it says two hundred and twenty some, uh, because it, in these electric cars, you really you don't charge them up to full maximum capacity you let them hit the mid-range like you only charge them to 80 percent and you don't let them get below 30 percent and that gives you you know the battery will last forever that way so uh so when i on my daily is charging up to 80 percent and then uh so this so when i wake up and, and i get going every day i have about 220 and when i get home i usually have like 60 or 70 Right. And so since it's enough, I haven't really compared what the odometer said and what the range predicted that I would get for, you know, for the day. So anyway, I went up to Lake Erie and uh, and and I I was watching my speed. Right. Because I was looking at this uh, this this graph that basically uh, showed the sweet spot where if you if you uh, you know, you punch the gas pedal, obviously, just like in a gas powered car, it would it really deplete your you know, your miles per gallon. And in an electric car, it's the same thing. It really, you know, really, you, that thing drops precipitously when, when, you, when you punch the gas. But another thing is that if you go, you know, above 75 miles an hour, it also drops quite a bit. So I kind of looked at the graph and I saw that, you know, that 70, between 65 and 70 miles an hour was the sweet spot where you, you got, you know, the, the biggest, furthest distance for the speed. And so going up 11, it's, you know, 70 miles an hour. So typically I'm, I'm a guy that, you know, 
keeps it below 10 miles over the speed limit. So usually I would be going about, I'd hit, I'd hit cruise and set it at about 77. That's about the right speed for me. But I didn't want to do that on this trip because I was already contending with the temperature. I didn't want to push my limits and, you know, and, and, and push it too far. So I, I set the cruise control at the speed limit the entire way. 680, speed limit. Uh, 711, connect, 711 connector, speed limit. Route 11, speed limit. The whole way I, I did the speed limit. And I, I'll tell you, within the whole trip from there and back, I wrote it down on a sheet of paper what I thought I was going to get based on that little uh, range curve. And I was within four miles of the range. I got four miles less than was predicted when I left, which was I think it was 260, maybe 270 when I left. And so w I, I said I was going to get home and there was going to be, you know, I don't know, 60 or something like that. But anyway, so within four miles, that was pretty good at uh, at the at the speed limit. Now, because I'm not used to driving exactly at the speed limit. You know, I was that guy in the right-hand lane where everybody's zooming past me, and I'm like, wow, that's me on a regular day. Hey, that's me on a regular day. It was kind of interesting to be on that side of it. It gets a little scary at, at the speed limit. So what I started doing is since I was driving at the, uh, you know, traveling a, a, an hour, I started thinking about what if I were to do that regularly? What if I would slow down to the, the speed limit? How much time am I really saving by that seven miles per hour? Right. So I, I did some calcul speed calculations and I'm going to share those with you so that as you're driving around, maybe doing a little bit over the speed limit, see if the uh, the extra speed. Now, I've always been told and I don't know if this is right or wrong. It could, could be an urban legend for all, all I know that when they're clocking and they're, you know, hitting you with radar and laser, that as long as you're not over 10 miles over the speed limit, they'll let you go. They don't consider they consider that within the tolerances, the calibration of the guns. They consider that, you, you know, within uh it, that's sort of their tolerance. They won't come after you uh, after time. And, and I was told this by a state trooper, and this was back in, uh, you know, the 90s. I was I was on my way to Columbus. I got pulled over. I was going 15 over the speed limit. He said, hey, keep it below 10. So I, that, I've always, always checked that out, and, and I really don't get speeding tickets when I follow that advice. So anyway, uh, so I, I looked at, uh, did these speed calculations. So if you're taking a 20-mile trip and you go 73 miles per hour, okay, you are it, it you're taking it's taking you 16 minutes and 26 seconds now if you take that si tw same 20 mile trip and you go exactly 65 miles per hour it takes eight minutes and 28 so there it's two minutes longer on a 20 mile trip and i use 20 miles because that's the that's sort of the average uh that people when they're you know commuting to work 20 miles seems to be the average commute to work so if you're on your way to work and you are five minutes late uh probably shouldn't you know even if you speed you're, you're not going to make up five minutes in a 20 mile stretch you just can't go fast enough to offset that speed so if if you just you know uh, if you know that it's only two minutes you're going to be plus or minus maybe the speed limit you know again I'm, I'm, I'm just making you consider it i'm not suggesting that you do anything other than just sharing raw data because i was interested in it being i was you know traveled at 70 miles an hour and it was so foreign to me Okay, so on a four-mile trip, 35 miles an hour, and this is the local commute, taking your kids to school or whatever. So a four-mile trip at 35 miles an hour takes six minutes and 51 seconds. And a four-mile trip at 44 miles an hour, nine miles over the speed limit, takes five minutes and 27 seconds. So we're looking at about a minute and a half difference to go the speed limit when it's a short four-mile trip around town. Again, a, mile, a, a minute and a half, that's, yeah, you know, negligible in, in my, it, it, you know, considering. So the trip that I took, 82 miles, I went 70 miles per hour. It took an hour and 10 miles, yeah, an hour, 10 minutes, 17 seconds. If I would have went 77 miles an hour, it would have been an hour, three minutes, 54 seconds. So that's about a, about a six minute difference between the two speeds, adding seven down. Now, the the the, re, the the next thing I consider is like okay well it's only two minutes and in the grand scheme of things over an hour trip six minutes you'd probably waste that extra stopping at a rest stop anyway so again that could probably be absorbed in the trip but then I thought what about anxiety what does anxiety do to you when uh, you're speeding and you you see a cop and you slam on your brakes and you're worrying about getting a speeding ticket so I looked up <laughs> I looked up what uh, what it, what stresses and anxiety does to lifespan okay how many minutes 
are knocked off your life when you are stressed out and worried, right? And so I had to look at a couple different studies, and I'm telling you, this is this was hard information to find. It's not it's not like you know you would think that we'd have a pretty good grip on how you know stress affects people's well being, but in this case, the uh, the data that I was able to calculate says for every 15 minutes that you're in stress, it has the potential to knock 5.76 minutes per day off of your life. So on my little trip here, that if you're in a 15 minute stint and you're speeding and you're stressed the whole time, you could actually knock for more minutes off of your life than you could save by going that extra speed. So that's there, there's your tolerances. If you save more than five minutes, you could die a little bit sooner and make up the difference. But anyway, raw data, this is the cool stuff that we do. Uh, the math is available, people. All right, uh, we got... Let's see. Let's see if I have time to take this call. Absolutely. All right. Let's go to Gil first. The phone number, 330-729-9977. Let's go to Gil. Gil, you're on the Youngstown Computer Show. How can I help you? Yes, good afternoon, sir. I'm Hi. looking to upgrade an old iPad that I have. I have an old iPad 2 that I got way back in, 19, in, uh, in uh, 2011 from your uh, early afternoon host as a gift. Oh, okay. And I'm, look and I'm looking to replace that uh, because the even... It won't even accept the new operating system. I'm way back on, I think, op, uh, operating nine on, on the old iPad. Anyway, what I'm looking at, I want to get your advice and counsel. Uh, I'm looking at either a, an Asus um, Chromebook Flip or to go ahead and spring for an iPad Pro. And yeah. I can't really see any reason not to go with the Asus Chromebook Flip. I'm hoping you can tell me why not. And cost-wise, it's probably, what, a third? Um, actually, uh, it's four seventy five for the Chromebook and fourteen hundred for the iPad Pro. Okay. Uh, now you know I I've been fascinated with the iPad Pro and I have not bought one because I just can't justify it. It doesn't do enough to justify that cost for me. Uh, so what what does the iPad Pro represent to you? What do you think you can do with it that maybe the Chromebook's not going to be able to do? Nothing. I'm just trying to, in my own mind, decide to not go there because I'm. I'm getting to be rather um, at least neutral, maybe even anti-Apple anyhow, just on social issues and such. But the Chromebook is very fascinating to me. And I, and I looked up a couple of sources, um, common sources of PC Mag and um, another source to see how they're listing the Chromebooks. And the ASUS goes right up there along with the um, Acers. I'm yeah. wondering if you have a preference or perhaps um, – uh, you have an idea on that, but then also I have a second question once you deal with that. Sure. So I, I have a Chromebook, and I, it, you know, it, it's such a very, it, it's such a good web computer. And so for our, you know, our elder population here that just needs to get on the web, uh, anything that you can do through the, uh, you know, uh, the Chrome browser can be done through a Chromebook. So a lot of people can get away with it. it it's less complicated. It doesn't have the problems that the full-blown operating systems do. You know, if you can do spreadsheets on uh, Google Drive and stuff like that. So you're really not limited if that's what you're doing. And most of us are, 90% of it. And then, it, again, the cost is such a big uh, advantage. So I probably, that that little Chromebook that only cost me maybe $250, mine isn't the, the touchscreen version or the, uh, the one that you got, but it's, you know, it'll probably last me twice as long as the regular uh, re regular desktop. So I'm a big fan of Chromebook if, if it, it doesn't, if your needs don't exceed what it's capable of doing. Well, my main need then would be to access, I guess, um, through the web, uh, just word processing. That's it. It'll do it just great. Okay. And the second question I have, if I may, sure, is uh, to to run that in the house, roughly a three thousand square foot house. I have an an old, uh, equally old uh, router that um, does pretty well, but it just doesn't have much of an oomph in a signal. Now, I don't know if that's from the router per se. Or if that's from the uh, stand I have from Armstrong. Yeah, and, and every five years is what I recommend going through and, and purchasing a new router. Uh, the standards constantly increase, and the routers did just kind of you know burn out a little bit. And it's it's worthy of every five years contemplating it. Um, I I just recently purchased those uh, the the Google Wi-Fi. Uh, you plug one of the little pods in like it's a router, and then the other two communicate with the main one, and it has done a fantastic job in covering my whole house. So I would at least look at something something mesh. So you have the one hooked into the main cable, 
and then two distributed through the home, so you have pretty good coverage throughout. That's it. All right, thanks for the phone call, Gil. Appreciate it. We're going to take a break. Break. We're going to come back and take some more of your phone calls. You're listening to the Youngstown Computer Show on 570 WKBN. We'll be right back. All right, welcome back, everybody. This is the Youngstown Computer Show. We're talking about things that are happening in tech. Uh, we just got off the phone with a caller. I wasn't quite finished uh, with that, but let me tell you a little bit more um, continuing that advice. So, Gil, I'm, I hope you're still out there. Uh, so, basically, the second part of your question was, uh, as far as routing goes, good coverage on your home. Uh, the reason I picked out the Google Wi-Fi and those pods is because they, you know, you really only have to worry about having one of the devices wired through, and the rest of them find each other using wireless signals, and so that you don't have to worry about running wiring throughout your house. I have some spots in in, in my house I just can't get a cable up through and it was weakness you know because one of them was back where the office was so i always had like really fringe you know i had like really fringe internet in the office and that was not a you know not a great thing so what i did was i got the wi-fi put the the cable comes in in my basement that's the one that plugs in uh the modem to the you know the i'm going to consider it a router because it has an input for a wan uh you know wan connection and then, like I said, then it rolls out the connection to the other two pods, and it extends coverage to wherever you put the pod. So I have one in the basement, one on the first floor, and then one you know, on the you know furthest r- distance on on the first floor, which gives me p- complete coverage. Uh, now, if you have the ability to wire everything in, wired is always going to be preferred. So if you, you you're, you're good with Cat Five or you have Cat Five that's already run through your house, then that's the direction that I would go. Uh, we like the brand Unify. And uh, it's made by Ubiquity, and uh, it's it's also mesh wireless. A uh, little bit more difficult, I would say, like from a, a, a beginner versus, you know, black diamond kind of a thing. Uh, the Google Wi-Fi, anybody could – it was plug in, and there was really no configuration. There was really nothing to do. On the Ubiquity, you have to put some software on one of the computers and create your configuration on one of those computers and then roll the configuration out to the devices. So there's a little bit more to it. Now, you can do more with it. You know, with that responsibility comes ability, right? So you, you're able to plug in your settings and you can get these things to dance. So e- there, there are even, you know, we have a couple of uh, bars, restaurants around here that wanted to extend Wi-Fi to their customers. And we used uh, Ubiquity equipment to be able to do that because literally uh, you can you can do so much. You could do in on a regular workstation, you, you install this configuration software and you can do advanced routing. So your computer will act as a router and control the, you know, the devices as they were like dumb terminals. So, again, those are our two recommendations. Uh, if you're doing one standalone router, the Netgear Nighthawk has been pretty full functional, pretty easy to plug in, and a good performer. It's got good range. And then if you want mesh wireless, if you, if you have wiring, go to Ubiquity Unify Route. And if you don't, give Google Wi-Fi uh, a shot. So, Gil, thanks for the phone call. Appreciated that. Uh, I'm sorry I didn't really get to go into the full depth of everything. And uh, those of you who did listen last week or the last time that we were on with uh, Morris Ray, he's going to be joining us in the second hour. Uh, he had, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll save the story for when he's actually here, uh, but he had a little run-in with um, with a scammer. And so we're going to kind of tell the story, and he can kind of share the after uh, and how he's cleaned everything up and fixed everything and, and whatnot. And we'll be able to get a little bit more in depth. Uh, those of you who are out there on the stream, if you've noticed that our uh, interface has changed a little bit, I put some time in this morning to put some graphics together. Uh, I wanted to I wanted to add in a component for chat over the next couple of weeks. So today I'll be playing with uh, the, the left-hand side of the screen. We'll have a little chat thing. So as people are posting, uh, we broadcast to Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Twitch, uh, I think one other, some one other one, and all of those as people comment will be uh, will be going through on the, the the chat screen, so I can engage and and get to the comments a little bit easier. There, I, I find sometimes that when we're doing the show, somebody uh, comments over on Facebook, and if I'm not super paying attention to it, I don't get the comment until after the show, and by that time it's it's too late. So uh, this will give me good access to be able to see the things as they're happening. And uh, give me a be- you know the ability to do a, you know better programming here. Uh, as always, you can text us at three three zero three 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 one five seventy. All program long, and I will be paying attention to that and reading your comments, suggestions, and and whatnot. And I- I'll tell you, I w- I was out today, and there are cars everywhere. It is a busy day, so commerce has happened here in good old Boardman, at least on this side of the uh, the the turnpike. 
All right, so uh, stay in, stay tuned there if you want to get on the lines, 330-729-9977. We're going to take this break, come back, take some more of your phone calls. You're listening to the Youngstown Computer Show on 570 WKBN. We'll be right back. All right. Welcome back, everybody. This is the Youngstown Computer Show. I am Joe Danier, owner of Youngstown Computer. Welcome, everybody that's listening out there on Terrestrial, over here on 570 WKBN, on iHeartRadio, on Facebook, on YouTube, and everywhere else that you're joining us here on the program today. I want to welcome you into the fray. Uh, the reason that we do this show is that um, we try to allow... Uh, all the novices and also the seasoned vets to talk about what it is that we do in this industry and let you overhear the conversations. And through that sort of context and osmosis, you kind of pick up on what goes on in this field. And it takes a lot of people who necess not, wouldn't necessarily sit through a class to be able to pick this up. A little intimidating to get around people who know more than you do. So you have two choices, either to say, screw this, I'm not doing this whole tech thing, or you got to have a safe place to be able to get enough exposure to it that you gain some confidence because really in this game it's about playing it's about jumping in and just like you were when you were a you know a 10 year old that you get to start sifting through what you like what you don't like and you know not be terrified that you're going to break something or you know ruin something and uh, most of the you know the software and hardware we, we still in, uh, have the luxury of this industry of this stuff being wide open completely configurable your imagination can let loose and uh and, and, you know, because it, it, it gets so complicated so fast, a lot of us kind of shy away from that kind of stuff. So this show was invented. We, do, we talk about it. We answer questions. We try to get you a little bit of confidence, give you a little bit of, you know, courage to go and, and start tinkering in this stuff. And uh, we've been here doing this for 10 years. So you're, there's not like we're going to get you started and then bail on you. We're going to be around for, for as long as you need us to. And uh, so I invite you to watch, listen to the show and watch it here out on the web and, and pay attention to what it is that we talk about. We, we, we vary our, our conversations because not, you know, troubleshooting and, and stuff like that, um, you're never, you're never going to be able to take the modules all the way through being an advanced user of Windows 10 based on a radio show, right? But this gives you a sampling of all of the different parts of technology and parts of business, how it applies to you know, what we're used to seeing out in the field. So through that exposure, you know, we give you a non-intimidating place to start talking about it. And we have a lot of fun. Uh, you know, it's one of the, we've done this for a number of years and, and I'm telling you, it's a, it's a joy to be able to do uh, and, and share some of the experiences and knowledge with other people and, you know, inspire them to get their hands dirty a little bit on a Saturday afternoon. So I want to welcome everybody, 330-729-9977. And uh, I, I, I did want to share this with you. We, uh, during this hour, we were going to speak with uh, a couple of the ladies from the YMCA Davis Center. And uh, if you listen to the program last weekend uh, on uh, the Joe Show, uh, what we're planning and we're contemplating here is uh, we're putting together some kids programming. Uh, and we're, we're going to partner, we're hope to partner with, the, with what the YMCA is doing. Uh, we we kind of noticed that they had already got have a really good head start with their families night out programs. And so when, you know, let's just say you're going out to dinner downtown for an event downtown and you want to drop your kids off at the YMCA, they will have, excuse me, projects planned and, and keep activities to keep your kids busy while you go out and about. And so our deal was we wanted to do the same thing. So we're, we're this proponents of downtown and we want parents and, and whatever to go to. Um, you know, the events that are downtown. And so we figured if you've got kids and that might be a reason that's keeping you from going downtown, Joe's going to put together some programs that are challenging for that group. See, I'm not a real big fan of warehousing kids, right? And sometimes when you give, you know, uh, a couple of dollars to a babysitter to watch your kids, they watch TV, play some games, and, you know, there's not much that it's it's not an event for them. So you get to go off and enjoy yourself and your kids are being you know, stacked on a shelf and just getting, you know, wasting a couple hours. So my programming is this. So think of a uh, an ex escape room. If, if those of you who have never done an escape room, what it is, it's a bunch of puzzles and challenges. They stick you in a room, lock the door, and then you have to figure out an end to the escape room, and then you you conquer it. You you win. You get to you get to leave. And the challenges sometimes are are very difficult, where you have to assemble lots of clues. And uh, but they're they're fun because of that challenge where you get a group of sometimes total strangers that are all in the same room, don't know one another. And you've got to create cooperation between people who don't know each other to be able to solve puzzles. That's the most dynamic thing of this whole thing is to watch people who don't know each other, put their brains together and, and try to solve big problems. So I know 
I know that kids will be way better at this than adults are because adults have reservations that kids don't. Kids jump in and they just do. And so I, I, like, I, I, won't, I cannot wait uh, to see how this stuff unfolds. Uh, we, we have a, a, an educator on staff, uh, Carla McCandless. She's, she's one of our uh, you know, key people at Youngstown Computer. And, and anytime we need sort of like that uh, educational filter when we develop these things to be able to you know, hit the kids on that level, she's our expert that helps us put that together. So I'm putting puzzles together and putting it through the Carla filter to really make these things dynamic. And I don't want, I, you know, I want the, when parents come and pick up their kids after the four hours that they're there, and they, they're, they're ecstatic because they, they beat the puzzle or they, they won the game or, or whatever. I want uh, the, the, the kids' experience during that four hours to rival whatever the parents did downtown, be it go on to a show or restaurant or whatever. So that's my goal. And uh, still, we'll, we're going to talk to uh, we're, we're going to talk to the ladies from the, from Davis Center. And we're also talking at the same time to. Uh, the people down at the downtown YMCA, and maybe we'll do some, you know, some hands off where we'll, we'll we'll do something in addition to what they are they're doing, or supplement some of their programs. But again, we're going to brainstorm uh, when we're able to bring them in on our next program. So that's coming up, and I did want to talk about that for a while because I mean it's it's uh, what's missing in this area, and I've noticed it from day one that I started doing business here is the level of cooperation that we always have been missing. And let me tell you a story. So when I first got started, uh, you know, when it when it comes to business, you, you can do a lot of things in your wheelhouse. And there's going to be like maybe 20 percent of what you do that you are the best at. You are the expert at. You hope everybody knocks down your door, asks you for what you are absolutely best at. Then you have some fringe stuff where you're you're, you're pretty good at this. You're probably better than most people. But, yeah, it's not your preference. And maybe there are people better there. And as this you know pyramid goes out, there's more and more things where you technically can do. But there are probably people better than you at doing it. So our philosophy has always been is let's go out. You know, if you come to me and say, hey, I got all this tech problems and I need you to help. You know, some of them we're going to be able to field ourselves. And then some of them we're just going to help you find someone that can do it better than than we can. And, and so w when when we would attempt this, we would go to other companies and say, hey, this is this is a customer came to me. And uh, they're dealing with me, and I'd really appreciate it. I want, I want to pay you for your services. I want to hand this off to you. So in this case, the story was that the, uh, there was app development. So we had a guy on staff that could put some pretty good app programming together. wasn't our specialty. We're in the field services thing. Uh, but uh, the, I went to a, a local programmer and uh, a, a company that did this for a living. This was their main deal, and, and I heard about them all the time. They did a really good job. I couldn't wait to put some work in their lap. And I said, okay, so this is my customer. I deal with them 99% of the time. Um, I'd like you to do this work, but do it as a contractor under my banner, right? And so I'm going to sit you down with them, and uh, I'm going to say this is, you know, contractor with Youngstown Computer, and they're going to tell you the specs on what they want. They're going to give you the explanation. And then once that meeting happens, I'll just turn it over to you. The thing I request is that you act under my banner, right? And so it wasn't 30 seconds into this meeting that the dude pulled out his business card for his company and handed it directly to the customer. And I cocked my head and I thought, y you know, this, this is why, th this is why that, that cooperation isn't able to happen because everybody is so eager for their part. They, they, they can't extend themselves and, and risk the fact that they go do work and they don't know, you know, their company name. But they broke the agreement in like 30 seconds. So I could just imagine uh, that this probably happens every day where people step over the line, you know, they're, they're not – playing from that ethical and moral playbook and, 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 you know, whether it be because it's just so competitive in this industry, every customer is so valuable that when you, when you have a potential one in front of you, it doesn't matter that you agree not to do something, but that, you know, that, that uh, is valued more than, than operating anyway. But the, 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 the thing is I'm, I'm meeting people now in the marketplace that are really eager to give up some interest or give up some, uh, opportunity in the name of cooperation and that what that what I love about that is that there are more possibilities when you have companies especially in the tech industry that are willing to not just go off and all do their th own thing but to find you know better people at this knowing that I'm going to exchange work with you and you're going to exchange work with me and that's always always pictured this where if you fear giving work to a web development company because they're going to try to poach your customer Right. You, you play defensive ball. And when you play defensive ball, that's when it really it's really hard 
to cooperate with other people in that industry. And that's why I see time and time again is that you, you, it, it gets ultra competitive and then uh, the you know gentlemen's agreements go out through the door super quick and it makes all of us be like, okay, well, you know, every company is going to try to be good at everything, which nobody can, right? And then the community suffers and the, you know, the marketplace suffers because of it. But we're going to pull all of that. And, and I had a meeting yesterday with someone uh, and we were talking about hybridization between uh, the marketing field and the tech field. And there's a there's some there's some companies that have been uh, being able to bridge a gap that don't don't even really sound like they're even in the same ballpark. But a, as you dig through the conversation, they're everything. These overlaps are getting so sophisticated. And IT is sort of the spokes that touch all of the different things. So I mean, you might find that contractors or healthcare or all these other marketplaces eventually have to tie in to something in uh, IT because it's ne it's never going to be or I, I should say it's not going to be in the in the short term. Where this is, this stuff's going to come together on its own. You're always going to need somebody who specializes in this uh, part of the field. And the more of these cooperations we we get together and and put together, I think as a you know the the Youngstown marketplace, we're able to grow. We're able to scale more because you don't have everybody inventing the same freaking wheel and never sharing opportunities, advice, and and personnel. And another opportunity that opened up through that is that the skill, the labor field in Youngstown. I, I hate when our best and best educated leave this area. And so we were talking about, you know, even cooperating on the skill sets. So we, we have, you know, people who are have a creative mind in, in design uh, where as a computer service company, man, I can't use a, a, a creative person except for maybe putting a little bit, a couple of web pages together, maybe doing some artwork for our marketing. But a marketing company needs creative people all day. So I, I want to open up uh, and, and start collecting resumes for some creative people. I have a feeling we're going to need probably four or five creative-minded people uh, that we're, we're going to need to hire before uh, before too much longer. And so if you'd like to uh, send resumes, please load me up. If someone, uh, you know, if someone has a creative bent and they're looking uh, for someone to use their expertise, this cooperative group that's coming together, um, it's it, it opens up possibilities where, you know, I'm, I don't know if it's, it's valuable, but you could be working for multiple companies doing work for multiple companies and and I know the excitement of doing that is that you're not you know you don't don't get slammed at a desk behind a computer and churn out work all day long that kind of a thing so uh, it, load me up with some resumes, technical minded, creative minded, and then we're going to sort through these. And we've got enough enterprises going that we're going to be able to place some talent and maybe, you know, employ personally and and and, and find places for a lot of good people. And, and what's nice about it is, is is these these people that I'm talking to, we're not looking lowest con common denominator. We're not looking for the lowest paid personnel. We, we are looking for top tier, best of the best and, uh, and and retaining them so they don't leave this area. So please, if you've got someone with a killer skill set and uh, want to be on sort of this, the, and, and there's there's more, I don't know, there's more, pa more passion that can be behind this when you believe in something like this and you're employing someone for this reason. Um, I, I'm telling you, it's it's such an easier thing to sell. And so if, you, if you'll uh, send those over, joe at youngstowncomputer.com, send me those emails, uh, attach your resume for it. Uh, I'm going to be heading out to Facebook and and ZipRecruiter and and do the state, uh, you know, the state website to try to collect some some resumes. We're going to go into a, a big hiring binge. Uh, so my guess is probably five. I, my I was I was feeling like two this year. I was going to get to hire. It sounds like more like five. Uh, we're going to get to hire. And these are you know forty, fifty, sixty, you know, seventy thousand uh, dollar a year jobs. So you know, please uh, send me those resumes, Joe at YoungstownComputer.com. And uh, we're, we're going get to uh, get to some interviewing. The, the interviews will sort of be a uh, uh, qualifying call first and then a sit down with uh, myself and, and another guy from that other company. And uh, and like I said, it's it, I, I know enough companies that are constantly uh, complaining that finding good people to hire is the hardest thing in their day. They just could not get people employed. And and I've always felt that this this should have been a problem that got solved a long time ago. Labor should not be the hardest thing in our on our job in our day. We've got the technology to take any skill set, right? And and you know if you're good, I mean I think you should be sought after. And I think the best people should be in demand. And it, it shouldn't be uh, something that an employer who wants to find somebody struggles to be able to find somebody. That's I, I don't know. It's just. I think it's backwards, and I think that uh, technology solves this problem. I hope they have like an 
an Uber for employment eventually. Maybe we'll create it. Maybe, maybe that's what we need is we need a, a better way of, of taking everybody like the uh, what's what's that realtor site that lists every house and all the realtors use a central location. That's what we need for people. And, you know, have the, the, the people, what they're willing to work for and have a come find me button on it. Right. Make it because I could I could make an offer on a house that isn't even for sale right now because of this website. Right. So everything is always up for, uh, you know, up for availability. Well, anyway, they, I'm just sort of vomiting out loud here on this stuff. So I hope you will. Uh, Send me your information, and if you if you even know someone who also, uh, you know, you either and you don't even necessarily have to be unhappy with the job that you're doing, uh, that maybe you know you're sitting in a job that you you settled with, and you know you want to get into something like design, uh, animation, uh, you know, making commercials, doing movies, 3D animation, that kind of stuff. If that stuff interests you. Uh, as well as you know, engineering in the uh, the, the networking field, making net computer networks running faster and solving problems with software. You know, send me your send me your resume. Three uh, and that is Joe at YoungstownComputer.com. All right, we're gonna take a break. We will come back, take some more of your phone calls. Uh, Want to say hi to everybody out there on the web. Uh, welcome. I hope you guys are enjoying the new stream. So three three zero seven two nine 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 seven seven. You're listening to the Youngstown Computer Show on five seventy WKBN. We'll be right back. All right. Welcome back, everybody. This is the Youngstown Computer Show. I am Joe Danier, owner of Youngstown Computer, and this is your show where we talk about things here that are happening in the tech world. Uh, had some questions come in or some comments. Let me go ahead and get those out of the way. Uh, this from text messaging. Uh, if a malicious link is clicked from a spoofed email, should the Windows 10 PC be reset as a precaution? Uh, Windows Defender and MRT tool did not find anything. Okay, so most of those uh, spoofing emails uh, that even after a click... Microsoft has been doing a really good job at keeping up with the security patches that don't make them, uh, you know, immune to it, but it really makes it a little bit more difficult for those things to take effect. They're really keying in on the Windows um, uh, Windows 10 or Windows 7 that have not been patched or not been updated. So a lot of those, if you click on it, didn't do anything, and you don't see any repercussions, then, you know, you, you're most of the time okay. Run your antiviruses, run a couple of malware scans, you know, do your due diligence on just making sure. Now, the only uh, guidance that I can give you is that sometimes the way they're doing this is those clicks are putting something on the hard drive that they can use later. doesn't trigger a, a virus response or a malware response. It kind of just sits on the hard drive. And then later on down the road, they can call on that file that's sitting there and make a pop-up happen or something like that. And then, you know, it may then be a little bit more legitimate. Uh, but just be careful. And a lot of times, like I said, if it doesn't hit you and you don't see the encryption and there's a bunch of new software that shows up and you don't get pop ups and whatnot, usually that's OK. Uh, I wouldn't suggest going and doing a reset. What I would do, though, is just in case do some extra backups because, you know, you're, you might be a little bit more vulnerable and you won't might not know until, until some time passes whether or not you are. Uh, but go overboard on uh, many different antivirus products. Uh, get a bunch of free ones, do a vast, do malware bytes, do, you know, anyone that you can come across that's that's free, uh, run it and then use your paid ones, obviously, and uh, until you're sure. And I guess and I said you can't be 100 percent sure, but uh, a lot of, a lot of those spoof messages are keying in on someone who doesn't do a lot of those updates. And so if that's you, then absolutely. Uh, OK. And a text message. Uh, this is from Paul. And Paul said, uh, iPad versus Chromebook, don't undersell the Chromebook. It's a very large development heavy, yeah, development heavy high client count enterprises are going with Chromebook. So and now I, I kind of gave the acid test where if you can get stuff to work through Google Chrome uh, as a retail user or an end user, then typically, you, you know, a Chromebook will work out for you. Now, there are, you know, and, and so with the, those who are shopping to use these in higher capacities, I'm not limiting them. Uh, you know, as, as Paul said, that they do have some capabilities that in an enterprise system that still very, very good operating system to work and work with. So I didn't thank you for Paul for the uh, uh, for the uh, the suggestion here. That, and I didn't want to I didn't want to do that. I don't want to take anything of Chromebook. I'm, I'm a big fan of it. And I think 
that it has a really big place in in this marketplace. All right, when we come back, we're going to go with uh, Morris Ray. We're going to have a sit down with him and talk about some stuff that he's been dealing with lately. Uh, more texts and calls from you, 330-729-9977, or you can text me at 333-1570. I'm monitoring the chat that's going on on social media as well, so I have a couple questions from Fred, and uh, stay tuned out there. We're going to come back right after these messages. You're listening to the Youngstown Computer Show on 570 WKBN. We're right back. All right. Welcome back, everybody. This is the Youngstown Computer Show. I am Joe Danier, owner of Youngstown Computer, and this is your Saturday show where we get to talk about things that are happening in the tech world, business world, enterprises, and, and whatnot. Uh, today, we have a special guest, uh, Mo Ray. If you've been following this uh, this story, I joined him a couple weeks ago, I think it was, and we started talking about uh, some incidents that he was get going through. He shared them some of the stories with us and we started talking about it and we sort of like ran out of time because there's there's some depth to this that I figured is, would be valuable to my listeners and your listeners. Uh, so welcome, Morris Ray. Thanks for coming. And I thank you. Uh, by the way, uh, just to plug myself, my show is heard Sundays, 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. right here on 570 WKBN. There you go. And I do thank you for inviting me and uh, we were talking before the break. Well, you want to t uh, want me to bring the tell people what happened, or yeah, do you want yeah. to bring us up to speed for for my audience? Okay, what happened was something that I'm not I'd never heard of before. Of course, there's a, various types of hacking that uh, that is possible out there. But what happened in my case was someone actually took my phone number. They called it porting out, which and that's you know P O R T. I I had never heard of this and. So I called Verizon, my company, and they told me I would have to uh, uh, fill out a police report and fax that to them, and then that would, they turn that over to their fraud pre prevention people, which they did. Uh, and then they gave me another phone number, which I gave to a bunch of people, said, oh, well, I guess this is it, because I was told uh, by fraud prevention on a Saturday after they looked at everything, they said, well, we can't get your number back. It's, it's, it's been given to another company. So then after I'd given my number out to multiple people, but by the way, this, there's more to this. I better tell the whole story. Uh, because we use our phones for so much, in the case of uh, a, a password verification or that kind of thing, what do they do? They send you a text to your cell phone. But whoever did this, and it was out of Florida, and I've never been to Florida, they eventually found their way into my bank account. And they, they, they tested the waters with like $100 out of an ATM, $200. But then they went big and got uh, a $3,000 transaction, $2,000 transaction. And, and it just, it, and my, uh, it, they even got into Google. Now, you probably understand all the particulars of how all this happened, but they got into my, my Gmail and I started getting all these bizarre emails from Russia, France, and Germany. And so all this stuff happened at once. And I decided to check my bank account because I was curious. I tried to uh, go online to get into the bank account. It wouldn't let me in. So then I went by the bank, and that's where I found out about all these transactions. But the bottom line is, with the phone company, is that they gave me this number on a Saturday, as I said, and I'm calling everybody the rest of Saturday and Sunday. And then I'm trying to also call uh, my other bank, and and they said, well, we can't do this because your caller ID is giving the number you say you don't have anymore. Verizon had returned my number to me, which they told me they couldn't, without notifying me that they had done so. So then I've got to contact everybody and say, oh, by the way, the old number's still good. But and I've had to change passwords. I've had to go back and uh, I have a lot of auto pays for my bills and stuff. I had to notify all those people new uh a new ATM card it's just and and as i said i thought it was resolved but now i was trying to set up a new auto pay because I, i'll even tell that part of the story uh, i ended up with a bill verizon dropped the ball here i'll say this i uh, you guys are good but do you talk to one another apparently uh, fraud prevention put some kind of hold on my account but also when they gave me that new number and I asked him if that would happen. The guy at a local store, he said, no, they wouldn't do that. But when they gave me the new number, they treated it like it was a brand new phone account. So I got charged for a new phone, uh, well, new service. And I also had to, I got a charge for the balance of what was owed on the phone that I, the original number was on. 
Basically, I had a phone, a one-month phone bill of $547. Dang. So that's since been resolved, supposedly. I've still have, I have had to eliminate my, my Verizon account, and I'll have to reestablish it because apparently, as I said, I don't know if the left hand is talking to the right hand, but fraud prevention still had some kind of hold on my account. If you ever go through this, though, folks, it is such a pain. You take everything for granted. Particularly if you're listening to this show, you're, you're, you're tech savvy, or at least you're trying to get there. But the things you take for granted, uh, the headaches that can be caused by somebody who doesn't even know you, uh, to the credit of my bank, my, well, my main bank, Chase, uh, they made me whole within uh, less than 48 hours. I had money back in the account, FDIC and all that good stuff. But it's just creepy that... Uh, this this is a whole new thing, as far as I'm aware of. This thing of using the phone as the uh, entry point into your life. Oh, by the way, I was told this wasn't true identity theft because they didn't set up accounts. This is what she, uh, uh, the lady, told me. It's some type of impersonation, is what they call it. So basically, they were pretending to be me. But it's still scary stuff. And and as I ask you on my show, what's the best way to avoid situations like this? All right. So to give you the history, um, they, they, it used to be that when you bought a, a, a phone number from a Verizon, the phone number was purchased and owned by Verizon. The, at some point down the road, they made it so that number was portable to you, where when you moved, you can tell, release Verizon, bring it with you to whoever you go to. So they were exchanging these phone numbers where it, it goes out of one system and into another. OK, so that's where it started, where, you know, uh, uh, give the ability to move that around. Had they not done that, nobody could have moved that that on you anyway. But right, to that point, I would say also they weren't supposed to be able to do that without my pen. That's exactly which right. I had given to no one. So I'm tr still trying to figure out how they made that happen. Yeah. And, and it's probably since they were brave enough to do it in store that a rep probably pushed that one through. Because on the phone, they wouldn't have the ability, without you providing that number, they wouldn't even talk to you. You know what I mean? So, uh, But the second part of that is that because your phones play, play such a pivotal role, like you said, that, uh, that they text message you to verify your identity, it put that as a huge, uh, you know, a valuable target to set up identity theft. Because if they had your phone, they can have those reset messages sent to themselves under a, you know, a spoof device. So, but... So the first part is if you do not know or can't remember what your PIN is, call your provider and make sure absolutely that you have one set and make it as sophisticated as you possibly can. Because that's the one way if they port it away from you uh, is, and like in Morris's experience, once they have it, I'm really surprised that you were able to get it back because that, that took participation then on wherever they transferred it to then send it back to Verizon. That's a really difficult prospect once somebody has control of it. And that was the impression I was given by the lady from fraud. But as I said, don't know how the magic happened, but it happened. But I'm a, and I'm not, I hate to sound like I'm griping, but I'm thinking, would you at least tell me when you do something? I mean, I'm glad I got the phone number back, but they didn't notify me. There was no text or anything, no phone call. So I just found out the hard way, but uh, yeah, happy ending. I've got my old number back, but uh, it's just scary stuff, and you think you're 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 doing everything, and I do, and and I have changed passwords, but I, we talked about that. Maybe you can touch on that again. Sure. Maybe someplace when you, if you really want to have multiple passwords, how many of those can you keep in your head? There's got to be a nice lock box, so to speak. Sure. You can put those in, right? Oh, absolutely. And and so I I went after we talked, I went introspective, and I I looked at my stuff to say if that if that should happen to me tomorrow, how set up am I for that? And I'll tell you, I wasn't as set up as I thought I was. Once I started listing out accounts and listing out, uh, you know, uh, passwords that I used and listing out the, 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 the pin codes, there was a lot of stuff that was not very unique and not really hard to figure out. So it took, it took me evaluating that and how stupid I was when I first set up. Cause it's, when you set something up new, you're like, I'll just send something simple now. Cause I can't come up with it and I'll change it later, but you never go around and change it uh, yes. later. So it was uh, basically what I did after I talked to Morris is I took uh, uh, the, the different credit card accounts, bank accounts, investment accounts, and whatnot, and I listed them one by one. And I tried to log into each one of them and check there's all of them have sort of like a security tab or a section of it that deals with some kind of security. Most of them, if you visit the security tab and it's not fully set up, it won't let you do anything until you provide 
today's level of security that they require. It'll nag at you and not let you go and make any other changes. So that's pretty good indication that if you don't have a pin or you don't have security questions set, uh, you know, so on and so forth. Now, here, here's some regular standards that, that you might want to follow. Now, as, as Morris said, having something besides your brain managing what passwords you use. If you use your brain, chances are you're going to make passwords too easy. If you can remember them, then somebody can figure them out. And, you know, we, when we have a tendency, we set a password, we use it for decades, right? And we don't change it because that's our go-to. And if you start changing it, then you forget what it was, and then you go do this password dance every time you want to log into a website. So there's two that I like, Dashlane and LastPass. These two programs basically uh, manage the passwords and create the passwords. I don't even know my passwords, okay? And so the you, you want to go through a cycle of maybe every six months changing your master password to something that is different from all the other passwords that you've ever changed. And sometimes changing uh, a character, like in you know using an exclamation point for this year and you, using an asterisk the next year and a dollar sign the next year is different enough that you know they don't waste a whole lot of time trying to, uh, to to figure out your password. They try passwords that they hacked from other accounts. So they get Home Depot, they see that your email had a Home Depot account. They take that same username and password and try it on every website that, that's out there, and they get some hits. If you use the same username and password combination, that might unlock Chase, so that might unlock you know, Bank of America or something like that. So using different ones at di different periods means that if they have one with an exclamation point, they're not going to go through the symbols to see that you change it to something else, that it's just going to be unsuccessful and they're going to move on to the other people. Uh, and, and if you allow Dashlane or LastPass to make up your password, they're going to make up a really super sophisticated long password that nobody's going to be able to hack. OK, and especially if you don't even know it, you're not going to write that sucker down. So you, you, you're 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 uh, you're you're bought into that system and it really is a good system. But OK, so you go to Dashlane and LastPass. I mean, well, what's to say that they can't be hacked or something? I oh, mean, they could. They, yeah, I mean, it, it very well could. And, you know, uh, the the premises of both of those websites, I trust how they're doing it. I mean, there's always going to be a weak link where their database isn't encrypted or somebody gets in. They're a target there. But I think they have a, a better chance of doing the job protecting it better than me protecting my own stuff because that's their whole business. You know what I mean? Yes. And we talked also about these things like LifeLock and that kind of thing. Uh, worth it. You know, I'm going to look up at over this next break. I'm going to look up to see how far they go in the mitigation part because I know that they'll make phone calls on your behalf. I know that they'll run credit checks on your behalf. But I'm wondering if, like, the Verizon thing happened. And you did, let's just say Verizon wasn't willing to take away the $500 new connection bill. How much LifeLock would absorb under those, you know, the, those incidents that are connected to that? If they're more insurance, if they're insurance, then it might be worth it just for that aspect of it. Because you can, I mean, think about it. What if you'd have had to pay that $600 bill, you know? <laughs> I think I've been going to another phone company. But, no doubt. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, this is just, it, it's just fascinating, though. We have become so uh, attached to these phones. And they're more than phones, of course, you know. Your life is in your hand. And I, I, I tell people that, and they don't think about it sometimes. But, uh Okay, so that's a good tip. Oh, also, uh, you mentioned the credit bureaus. I did notify the credit bureaus, and the great thing is now they work hand-in-hand. Hand. I really notified uh, uh, Spirian, I believe it is, first, and then I got corresponding letters from Equifax and um, all the TransUnion. Uh, uh, TransUnion, right. So now for at least a year, there is a security freeze on my account. I mean, you can take it a step further, but the bottom line is now they'll be looking for any suspicious activity. And, you know, there's just so many, so many threads that are, are could be pulled here. I mean, you, I think I've covered everything, but and then you, the, oh, wait a minute, I forgot, I've got auto pay over there I need to take care of or whatever. Yep. Yeah, and and so now, do you do you have a sort of an inventory of your accounts now that you've gone through this? You have a pretty good handle on what's out there. Yes, uh, I'm trying to think. Oh, I, oh, ironically, I do uh, have to uh, change one more. But yes, now I know exactly what I'm dealing with, large and small. And it is, you know, it's just okay. But uh, once more, going back to the services you yeah. mentioned, uh, the uh, uh, what was it? Last LastPass and Dashlane. Okay. Uh, 
where are those held? I mean, if 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 I have a situation where maybe I can't get into my Google, uh, you know, my Google Chrome or whatever. Uh, so you you can walk up to a computer and you can install the add-in that is LastPass. You provide your username and your password, and then it opens like a website, like a vault with all of your passwords. So if you wanted to then take a computer you trust and elevate it to your new manager, you can do that. Okay. All right. We're going to take a break. Come back, take some more your calls, and talk to Morris here, 330-729-9977. You're listening to the Youngstown Computer Show on 570 WKBN. We'll be right back. All right, welcome back, everybody. This is the Youngstown Computer Show. We're here with Morris Ray. We're talking about some uh, some porting, spoofing, scamming, that kind of stuff. Uh, Morris is sharing his story. Uh, we have some calls out there, so I'm going to take these calls. And if you have some questions for Morris or you want to chime in on the conversation, uh, feel free. Let's go. Irvin is first on the lines. Irvin, you're on the Youngstown Computer Show. How can I help you? Uh, hello. Uh, I wanted to mention to you about the uh, you mentioned about the uh, hacking uh, before. Uh, the Casey Malone had got hacked some years ago. They had the they had the afternoon program, her and Ron Verb. Yeah. So you know how long ago that was. Oh yeah. Because I watch her on I watch a TV show every once in a while. But anyway, I wanted to mention that. I wanted to mention this too that the computer's working fine. You did some work for me about six, seven, eight weeks ago. Working fine. Awesome. Now Good to one hear. more, one more quick sure. thing. Sure. What you say about? Me? No, go ahead. Uh, I wanted to say this. How can you get off this phone? Uh, I have the phone that I'm on now. I get this buzzing, and I get like 112, 164 messages on here. And I don't know who in the heck would be sending me messages. I don't think I know that many people that want to send me a message. All My right. daughter tried to tell me something, but she's in Seattle. And uh, she's a computer nerd, but I couldn't get what she was saying. She was trying to tell me about press one and press reject and press this, and I didn't, I didn't get with it. Do you have any solution or something like that? Yeah, thanks for a call, Irvin. Appreciate it. And basically what you want to do um, is that the, the, in, o, in Ohio we still have – um, you know, so we have the do not call list and it, it does help a lot for unsolicited calls. You have to go to, I believe it's at the FTC website. You have to register your phone number and you have to do it every single year. So if you've done it in the past, you're going to have to do it again. And so any new solicitations that come in, they'll have to conform to the law that says they're not allowed to call you. They're not allowed to use that number. It's a private call. Now you also want to sort of do prevent on it where you don't want to give that the number out. Uh, as part of marketing. You don't want to put it on the business cards you put in the fishbowl at restaurants, stuff like that. If you can run that kind of prevent, not give that number out, uh, it, it'll help cut down the, on those as well. Um, they have these third-party rules where they keep they can share, especially with political campaigns and, and whatnot, they're, they're, they allow to share those addresses to send campaign notifications out to you. So if you've given to a campaign, uh, your number probably gets circulated a whole lot. So my advice, again, would be to have maybe have like a Google voice number that you give out for these marketing solicitations, not your primary phone, because once they start coming, it's extremely difficult to notify enough of them. Uh, I have a, a, a service that I use on mine called No Mo Robo, okay? And this is basically they have a national database of, of or origins of solicitation calls. And this app will, will make it so my phone doesn't ring or ding. It'll just kind of get rid of it. If it's on the list, it's an offender, and the call won't come in, into my phone at all. So where I might be getting 50 or 60 of these calls per month, I don't ever see any of them because that database is taking care of those those messages. I just want to say, though, interesting. Yeah. You know, and I, 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 I won't say I was bashing, but I had, I had some bad things to say about Verizon. But a good thing they do have is they've got a, uh, a filter for that kind of thing. If, if it'll tell you if it's a robocall, it will tell you, uh, you know, it's like it's got a little meter and it comes up and it just tells you how likely this is to be something you probably are not interested in. So to their, to their credit, I do appreciate that. And you're right about, you know, I don't know. I don't know if you've noticed, but if you ever heard my show, sometimes I get a little political, and uh, I, yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and maybe that's why I've been getting a lot of calls from D.C. and places like that. I don't even pick up anymore because it's just like you're right. They must have handed the list out, and I'm getting all this all this garbage that I'm not interested in. Yes, I do give to who I want to give to when I want to, but I don't need to be 
harassed constantly. Yeah, and you can't do it anonymously. You can't give a campaign donation, so you have to give up your number, and then now you're in that system. So it's yes. tough. But Verizon is pretty accurate on their predictions as far as what, what is constituting spam incoming. All right, so we're going to be right back. We're going to stick here with May. We've got a couple more calls that lined up, so if you have questions for May, get on the line, 330-729-9977, or if you have any experience with the spoofing, scamming, or anything else we're talking about here. You're listening to the Youngstown Computer Show on 570 WKBN. We'll be right back. All right, welcome back, everybody. This is the Youngstown Computer Show. We're sitting here with Morris Ray. We're talking about uh, a recent incident he had with uh, a couple of scammers went crazy with uh, porting his number over and ruining a couple of weekends i'm sure a couple of evenings i'm yes. sure right uh so we got some calls lined up there i'm going to just go right to them if you're okay with that 330-729-9977 let's go to carmen next carmen you're on the youngstown computer show how can i help you yeah i, I just want to say morris i feel sorry for you nobody should have to go through that i mean there's just some real low-life scumbags in the world well we uh, agree on that sir and and yeah. you know what? It's just so weird that some I've never even set foot in the state of Florida, and all this transpired in Florida somehow. But of course, it is a World Wide Web, so uh, it they can they can screw you from anywhere. To be blunt about it, I, I, it shouldn't happen to anybody. I don't listen to your show because I don't agree with your politics, but it still shouldn't have to happen to anybody. I wanted to know from Joe. Uh, I think it was Philadelphia is planning on. Uh, not using cash anymore you'd have to use your uh, like a smartphone to pay uh, how do you feel about that um it, it's a worthwhile experiment i i mean i, I think that you know there's the the, te the technology is there where it could be pulled off uh the problem is that if you don't sort of have sort of unified adoption it gets really crazy because you'll have part of the population who are just alienated from commerce and you really don't want right. that to happen i have I mean, a feeling it's going to might have not have the technology in your phone you might not have your bank set up to deduct the money, and uh, I just see headaches with that and all of this autonomous stuff. I don't think we're ready for it. Uh, how do you feel about it? I'm, I'm getting a lot of things like from Facebook. They want two uh, methods of proving who I am. They want my phone number, and not only Facebook, other ones. Besides your password, they want a, a second method of verification. I mean, you think that's a good idea? It, it is, and, and they're real limited on how they can prove individuals are not you know, meddling like uh, we saw you know, around the election time. And so with the limitations, I mean, it, it, it's tough because they want to grow their usership. And at the same time, they don't want to be polluted with a bunch of fake accounts that, you know, wreak havoc. I mean, I, I probably receive maybe 10 or 15 spam uh, uh, friend requests on, on Facebook. And I got to dig through to see if they're a real person or it's someone who just wants to send me porn links or stuff like that. Yeah, I know a lot of my relatives have said don't, uh, don't re-ask to be my friend because they were hacked a couple yep, of times. Yep, for sure. And they, they don't want to go through that. Okay, uh, thank you. Good show again. Thank you, Carmen. Appreciate you being out there. Yeah, can I ask a question? They're talking about that sure. authentic, uh, authentic, authentication. One thing that I see that a lot of the, the sites offer or, or ser uh, different services is the fingerprint. Uh, I'm not trying to be paranoid here, but I'm always worried as in the world of hacking if they can, if, if you're using that as an identifier, what's to say they couldn't take that fingerprint and and use it, you know, uh, hack your fingerprint. Is well, here, here's my, and I don't know, I don't know how they do it, but here's what I think is happening there. Your, your phone is actually taking a picture of your fingerprint and translating it to some kind of numerics, and then they're using the numerics to qualify you, not necessarily the picture of your fingerprint. Okay. If that's happening, you're, you're a little protected because if someone gets your numerics, it doesn't matter. They can just get to your phone, and nobody would actually do that. And then that means that they can't replicate your your fingerprint based on you know reverse engineering the numerics. Yes, because that that's a little spooky. Yeah, I'll look into it, but I I wouldn't see that they would do something stupid like take a picture of your fingerprint and start putting that into your profile. That would be <laughs> ridiculous. All right, three three zero seven two nine 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 seven seven. Let's go to Tim next. Tim, you're on the Youngstown Computer Show. How can I help you? Hey, um, I'm actually a computer expert. I'm calling in to try to help Morris out here, but. Um, I got a list of things here. I know you said LastPass and stuff, but I use RoboForm and have been using it for a long time. They actually have a feature. I haven't really looked at LastPass and stuff, but RoboForm has a feature where it actually detects your weak and reused passwords and has a thing that lets you redo those. Um, in terms of Morris, how it works, 
your all your data is encrypted with 256-bit encryption, and it's based on the password with RoboForm that you use. So they they only store the encrypted data on their database. So even if someone hacks in, unless they got your password, they can't decrypt that password, which is really great. It sounds good um, to me. Yeah, the next thing to use is there is a thing with Google. If you have like a Google Gmail account, there's a Google Authenticator. So instead of you getting a text message for someone to hack into your email, like anytime a new device tries to get into my email, it comes through this Google Authenticator and I have to approve it on that or one of my other devices. So I have three or four devices that have that on there, but it's a good thing to set up. And then it's not just by your phone number because what, what it's a classic scam. They ported your, your phone number out and that's, that's like the keys to the kingdom. If you have this authenticator, you can only put that on another device that you, once you get authenticated, that you authenticated from another one of your devices. I um, certainly appreciate things, that. Yeah, a couple other things you want to check about now that may not show up. File with the IRS is a fraud thing. Um, there's a big thing where they file taxes as you and say that they get a big refund. And when you go to file your taxes, you might find that someone else had already filed as you now that you've been like I call a victim of identity theft. And then um, the other thing that people don't really look at, if you have a 401k or an IRA or anything like that, you need to go look at those things also because that's another thing that they go in and try to hack you in on and stuff like that. Well, uh, by the um, way, I, I did do that because that was after the bank situation. I said, okay, my gosh, could they get into the 401k as well? But that, that is good. So, But I, you know, I thank you for your helpful hints. Yeah, and, and the last thing I would definitely recommend, instead of just that credit monitoring, I would freeze your credit, and um, I would have it frozen, and I think you could have up to like a 20-digit password, and if you use one of these programs like a RoboForm, it'll randomly generate a 20-digit password, and as a matter of fact, like I'm on T-Mobile, um, it's a pain to talk to them, but I do have a 20-digit PIN number on my account that someone can't port my number out, and when I need it, I go into that RoboForm and I just read them the number out of there because RoboForm stores passwords, it stores all my credit cards, it stores what's called safe notes, so you can just have like a note, and it's all encrypted, so unless someone's really good at guessing my very long password, one password that I remember for everything, no one's going to get into my stuff. So, again, I, I hate that it happened to you, but, you know, um, those are the tricks that I know of out there, so... All right, Tim. Thank you so much for the phone call. Appreciate Thanks, you participating. Uh, and yeah, RoboForms. I uh, th that's actually there's a lot of my uh, my commercial customers that uh, they use RoboForms. It's really good. I, I'm wondering what the pricing is on that. I remember it not being super cheap, uh, but it does a really good job. It's more than just password management, like you said. Mm -hmm. It was it's credit cards and and whatnot. Do you have a ballpark when you say not super cheap? I'm, I'm looking right now to see. Uh, I'm on their 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 page. I want to mm -hmm. see what it is in comparison because I think. Well, anyway, um, and let me take and and explain that. Um, no, it's like one year for thirty bucks. It's not expensive. Oh well, so well, individuals are thirty bucks. That's priceless. Heck yeah! All right, and for commercial ones though, it's like twelve hundred dollars a year. So individuals, mm -hmm. it's great. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So and, and about the, and that, this is how this works. And and so when you encrypt data, when you have your stuff stored, okay. So when you let's just say you're using like an encrypted VPN tunnel. Um, there, when your data is being transferred, it's basically scrambling the information and stored in its scrambled form. And then when you retrieve it, it unscrambles it and delivers it back to you. So as long as where you store your stuff, it's in its scrambled form. Even if they looked at your password in the database, they couldn't see it. Okay. So that's what gives you, if, a, if a, any of these services, uh, say that they're 256-bit encryption or something like that, that is really sophisticated, high-grade levels of encryption that are almost impossible to be able to crack. So, Well, that sounds like a winner. There That's you go. All right, more phone calls here, 330-729-9977. Let's go to Ray next. Ray, you're on the Youngstown Computer Show. How can I help you? Hello, gentlemen. Hi, Morris. Uh, hi, Hello. Uh, listen, hey, Ray. Let me ask you a question. On Morris, did they, did they ever find a break-in point for you, or are they still looking? Uh, actually, uh, it's still a question mark to me. I mean, and, and by the way, it, it occurred to me that I also had a situation with PayPal, which I'm not sure if this could be related to this or not. I had a PayPal situation maybe a month before this happened, uh, where I was alerted that I uh, that 
I had a weakness in my PayPal account, and I uh, I used to just leave it on all the time. Now I don't do that. I I I have to resubmit every time. Uh, but no, Ray, I couldn't tell you exactly where this happened. I worry about it. I mean, I was thinking, you know, because of uh, because I do a political talk show. I I it could have been random, but sometimes I wonder: was this a malicious act? Was this somebody? trying to uh, uh, induce a little pain, which, by the way, mission accomplished, but... Uh, pain felt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you got... I, I, I wish I I wish I did know, but apparently, uh, I, as far as what Verizon can tell me, they didn't seem to ha- uh, know how this took place, particularly since they didn't have the pen. Uh, uh, Google, you, it, you can't get a human being at Google. No. Most, you know, that's just ridiculous. So... However this happened, it's still a mystery to me. But as I said, I do applaud the bank and the fact that we have FDI, FDIC insurance, and they, they were very quick to, to make things right again. Uh, I, I have, uh, as I've said, I think Verizon needs to make sure they're speaking to each other about this so they, uh, their local people don't tell you one thing when the guy on the 800 number is telling you everything's cool. But no, uh, yeah. sorry, go ahead, though. If you get an opportunity, you know, later on, if you ever find that, I, that, that might be interesting uh, information. Uh, for Joe, Joe, can this happen because of, like, friends or contacts, or does it affect friends and contacts? Because I have a contact that this happened to, and it makes me worried about it. Yeah, it, it, it gets really mobile because it uses email and messaging and text messaging to travel. And so if, if somebody you know that you send email to – gets infected or, or, or gets hit with one of these things, it usually uses, you know, the stuff that's sitting in its inbox or its sent box to then propagate itself to other people. So you might, you know, have a, a an email that looks legitimate coming from someone that you know, and and it's like, hey, here's an invoice attached, and you're used to getting invoices, and all of a sudden, uh, you know, you've given up some information. Um, so uh, like Moore said, though, it could be, you know, if you if you just get this, if you're just in a database that got hacked, it could they don't even necessarily have to know you personally to, to be attacking you. So it could come either way. Okay, last question, Joe. Sure. Um, when you look on Twitter and stuff like that, and you you look at, a, at like a website that uh, somebody suggested on Twitter, I have a Google phone and every now and then. Every now and then I get this thing, winner, winner, winner. Uh, you you know, you just won a $1,000 thing at, uh, here or a $500 thing there. It's like a pop-up ad. Is that like malicious? Thing? I mean, I just... X out of everything and start over and don't go back to the web page. And by the way, for my for my experience, it's usually an Amazon gift card. That's their that's their hook. I'm not, and I usually avoid them too. By the way, yep. And so the, I, I consider those poisoned ad networks. So if if a website that you go to has a, uh, we'll say that it, it they they take third party ads and display them on the page that you're looking at. The, the people who put those ads there, it's like syndicated where it comes from another source. So they can slip every once in a while an ad in there that has enough code to make one of these pop-ups happen. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have something on your machine that's malicious. It could be just that code was slipped by their, their the, you know, whatever prevents that stuff from happening. Usually it doesn't last long where those those ads get, um, you know, taken out of the ad network, but another one cycles through before long. So you can identify those pretty easy uh, try not to click on anything. I mean, they're just really good about being sneaky about that. But uh, really, there's nothing going to prevent those from happening. Okay. Thank you very much, guys. You're right. All thank right. you, Ray. Appreciate it. All right. And we have Craig next. Let's go to Craig. Craig, you're on the Youngstown Computer Show. How can we help you? Uh, it's Greg. But, oh, hi, Craig. Um, um, similar frustration. My uh, PSP file... <laughs> My Microsoft Outlook got corrupted, so I had to rebuild it, restore it. So, you know, that, that takes a while. And the first couple times it didn't work, we used the third-party uh, uh, software piece to get it rebuilt. So I got it rebuilt and restored. And then you got to go through all your contacts and make sure they're all in the right categories. And, and the calendar, what you know, you have different colors for different events, and that all has to be fixed. But now I still have a problem. My problem is I can't edit the um, the notes field in the in the in a contact. So I have Microsoft Outlook 2016, and I can't edit the. If I add a new contact, I can add notes into the notes field. Same thing with the calendar. If I add a new calendar event. I can add 
notes into the notes field, but I can't edit existing ones. The text is still there, but I can't do any editing. And I've tried to Google and search for that, you know, uh, context field is lost and stuff like that. And I, I, I just I can't figure it out. Do you have any idea what I might be able to try? This might be one of those ones where you need someone with a whole lot of expertise in, in Outlook. Uh, what I would probably do is after this thing gets rebuilt, see if you can do some kind of backup and create, you know, now that you've got one that's in semi-working condition, you might be able uh -huh. to take the one that's working now and then create another one and import your stuff from the old one to the, the new one. It'll recreate those records and make it, maybe make them editable in the, in the second version. But I, I have a feeling that it's going to take someone with a way more expertise than I have. Yeah, because even if you, you go into the context field and you can list all the fields, whether it's name, first name, last name, whatever, right. and you can right-click on them and check on properties, it, it doesn't allow you to change the properties. It just allows you to see what it is, whether it's text or integer or whatever. Yeah, and I'm thinking, like I said, if you could take that record in its, in its readable form and copy it to a new database, a new PST, it might be, you know, the text copies over and now the record becomes readable. That's what I would try first. If that doesn't work, I would probably, uh, you know, take the bite the bullet and put put a ticket into Microsoft and see if they can field it out. Well, yeah, that, I mean, that's the other problem. You know, you can't talk to Microsoft, you can't talk to Google, you can't talk to any of these guys, all these multi-billion dollar companies, and you can't talk to anybody. I, I hear you. It's and, very frustrating. Yeah, it is, too. Yeah, it's, it's a joke. Even if you send an email complaining about it, you think they reply? No, they don't reply. All right, Craig, thanks for the call. Appreciate it. Sorry, yeah. I couldn't help you out. Uh, and, and if anybody, you know, if you do have to call Microsoft, you, you can prepay for tech support with Microsoft, and it's not a cheap thing. Uh, maybe in the years that we've done this, we've had to pay for maybe two or three calls to Microsoft, and they'll, they'll ding you for about 300 bucks per hour and uh, they've always been able to solve it, but 300 bucks an hour, for, you know, from an engineer. For the is like, average person, though, yeah. that's absurd. Yep, absolutely. So, but it, there is ways. Um, but we have a, a place like Experts Exchange that will allow you to take questions like that and be able to put them in front of people who have, you know, credentials in these kind of equipment. So, Experts Exchange, check that out. All right, we're going to take a break here. We have another phone call coming up after the break. You're listening to the Youngstown Computer Show on 570 WKBN. We'll be right back. All right. Welcome back, everybody. This is the Youngstown Computer Show. I'm Joe Danier, owner of Youngstown Computer, and we're here with uh, Morris Ray today. We were talking about uh, the, the stuff that he hit. He's my, he is my favorite uh, talk show host from that side. I'll tell you. <laughs> okay. what, what, do you what do you say? You say it's I'm from the, the other, other side, side of talk radio. <laughs> <laughs> that is the real estate that Mo Ray occupies. All right, we're going to take this uh, phone call. Nate's on the line. We're going to try to squeeze this, squeeze this in at the last uh, couple minutes here. Nate, you're on the Youngstown Computer Show. How can we help you? Hey, how you doing? Real Good. quick, I've got two very quick questions. Sure. One has to do with laptop batteries. I hear you're talking about keeping them charged only up to 80 or 90 percent and never letting them get below 30 percent. Issue is I've got mine plugged in all the time. Is there a setting on a computer, number one, to say, hey, stop charging at 80 percent and you know, charging in at 30 so that I can save the battery life. And the second question is unrelated, but when it comes to using an animated type of program, does a video card help with the speed? Because it's so sluggish, it hardly renders. Uh, those are the two questions. I know they're unrelated, but I wanted to get them in. Sure. Okay, so your first one, uh, batteries, lithium-ion especially, they've come a long way in having computers be able to manage them, so you don't really have to do a bunch of crazy stuff as far as 80%, 30%, like you do with a car, uh, you know, electronic electric vehicle. Um, you know, life-wise, they don't last beyond five years even if you treat it perfectly, so it's usually not worth the effort to take do anything special with it. Just kind of know that your horizon's five years. When you get to the point where it discharges and won't last, you know, more than 30 minutes, then it's time to get a new battery. Thankfully, those batteries have come down in price where you're probably going to pay $75 for a replacement battery. Uh, so that's your first question. Now, as far as animations go, uh, video cards recommended when you're doing lots of rendering. So if you have geometry calculations that's going on, video cards do a lot better job with doing those kind of calculations. If you're doing flat, non-3D, non-geometrical, uh, you can get away with a regular uh, video card. If the project that you're working on is, is immense, 
the extra video memory will help. So it's not necessarily that it has to process a whole bunch of math, but it has to store a bunch of, you know, a, a bunch of project data. So really, usually people who do that kind of work, uh, they do go for an upper end video card, but it's not totally required. Okay, and is that same like with a laptop? Can you transfer some of your memory over to a video memory? Because there's not really a way to put in a laptop now. Uh, you, video card you kind of have know. you kind of have to buy it with one already in mind. Uh, the one that I do the the video production here uh, is not it's not all that expensive. You just have to make sure that it's not like you know you you have the cards that are made for business operations versus you know graphics. So if it if it puts itself as a, a video player or a gaming machine or something like that, chances are it's got a video card integrated that's capable of doing those kind of calculations. Perfect. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I appreciate your show. Yeah, thank you very much for being out there. Appreciate it. Uh, anything else that you have to add about your experience that you think that you want to, you know, cautionary tale warnings? No, I would just say, uh, you know, use some of these these uh, services that, that uh, Joe has talked about as far as encryption and uh, changing the passwords and all that. And and check your stuff regularly. I I. I could have just gone on and, and, and got caught up in something else and not even looked at the bank. I'm glad I went to the bank. The, I mean, I'm glad I tried to check my bank account the very next day because uh, it would be very embarrassing at the very least, beyond embarrassing. You're, they've taken your money, but you're out somewhere and you think, I got all this money in the bank. and Declined. Yeah, well, they left three cents. That <laughs> oh, was nice. nice of yeah. <laughs> Go ahead and plug your show here while we're running out of time. Well, Tell us where we can find you. You can check us out on Sunday mornings right here, 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. on News Radio 570 WKBN. And by the way, had a personal experience with your service at Youngstown Computer. Great job. Great people. Thank you, sir. All right. Thank you much. See you guys next week. You've listened to the Youngstown Computer Show.